as far as announcements this evening. So if you guys are in the book of Ruth, it's right there after the book of Judges. If you turn too aggressively, you might just skip it because it's only a couple pages, being only it is four chapters long. And our goal is to look at the first uh, chapter and... Uh, we're only talking about 22 verses, and last week we did 103 verses, so <laughs> a bit of a contrast. The whole book actually is only 85 total verses, and we'll talk about that here in the introduction, but let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for today, and uh, Lord, as we uh, gather together, um, Lord, we just want to thank you on this Veterans Day, Lord, for those who um, chose, Lord, to serve um, our country and to uh, protect us and um, fight, uh, Lord, for the freedoms that we are blessed with. Lord, we know that those freedoms uh, come from you, and we just are uh, thankful for that um, every day, but Lord, uh, set aside on this day. Um, God, thank you for uh, today, and as we get ready to look at the book of Ruth, Lord, we just ask that you would speak to us as we look at this rather short book. Lord, we see that it is a book well, Jesus, it's a book about you and us, actually. Lord, this is a love story between a redeemer and the one whom is being redeemed. So, um, Jesus, I just pray that you would connect those dots in our head as we study this out and that we would see you in the center of this story. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So, as we get ready to dive into the book of Ruth, uh, whenever we start a new book, we like to do a little bit of an introduction so that we just have a good background. And a good way to kind of do an introduction is just answering a few questions. The first question is who, as far as who wrote the book of Ruth. And the book doesn't tell us who wrote it. Uh, some Bible books do. The author lets us know who's writing it, but there's many books that don't. But the, uh, the Jewish thoughts from way back in the day is that Ruth was written by um, uh, Samuel. So the same uh, one who they believe wrote Judges and Ruth and then First and Second Samuel is responsible for writing here the book of Ruth. So that's who wrote it. But who the book is about is a lady by the name of Ruth. And she is... Uh, very unique in the Bible. The book of Ruth actually is very unique in the Bible because it's only one of two books that carries the name of a lady. The first is Ruth, the second is Esther. And what's actually interesting about these two books that bear the names of ladies is that Ruth is a story about a Gentile and Jewish country. Esther is a story about a Jew and Gentile country. And uh, they're both uh, very uh, fascinating books to, to dig into. But here we have Ruth, and, and her name means friend or friendship. And as we start to dig into this study tonight, and then even more so uh, next week, we'll see that Ruth is actually a picture of us. Because um, Ruth is going to marry a fellow by the name of Boaz, Ruth, a Gentile woman, is going to marry a Jewish prince. And in order for that marriage to happen, he has to redeem her. And we'll see how that parallels us and Jesus um, as we get deeper into the book. Uh, Ruth is the eighth book in the, uh, in the Bible. And uh, it's pretty much been described as the Jewish Cinderella. This is uh, pretty much a, just a, a love story through and through, and uh, it's a book about redemption. It's a book about God's plan for the Gentiles, as we're going to see. Uh, this is, gives us a little hint as to what God's planning to do with the non-Jewish people through the life of Ruth. So, uh, what is this book all about? Well, we know that there's 85 verses in uh, the New King James anyway, and 17 times in those 85 verses, the word Yahweh is used, and uh, three times Elohim is used, two times El Shaddai is used, and I say that because 21 times total, we see God being referred to in, in some way in these 85 verses. 20 times we see the term redemption used. So the Lord's name is referred to 21 times. The word redemption is referred to 20 times. And this book truly is a book about the Lord redeeming. And uh, we'll get, see that as we continue on. We see that this is just about God's faithfulness. When was this book written? We'll see when we get into verse number one. But during the time of the judges, so somewhere between 1400 to 1050 BC, many uh, scholars believe it was right there around the time of Gideon uh, when he was a judge of Israel that Ruth was written. And where did this book uh, 
Where was it written from? Bethlehem, we will see, and also parts of Moab. And uh, we'll see Moab here as we get into chapter 1. So let's just dive right in. Ruth chapter 1 verse 1 says this. Now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. And a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. So we have a family that comes onto the scene, a dad, a mom, and two sons. And they come from the area of Bethlehem, Judah, and there's a famine in the land. But verse 1 lets us know the time frame of this book. It says, now it came to pass in the days when the judges ruled. Now, we just got done spending a couple months studying this time of history when the judges were ruling, and this was a dark time indeed. As Judges chapter 21, verse 25, the last book of the, or verse of the book of Judges says, you know, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own sight. So it's during this time when there is no king and everyone's doing what's right in his own sight, that the story of Ruth is happening on the sidelines. As corruption is happening with Israel at large, God is doing a special work with this family in the book of Ruth. So it says, now it came to pass in those days when the judges ruled that there was a famine in the land. All of a sudden, uh, there's an issue with the crops, and they're not able to produce like they once did. And this is going to cause this family to move. It says, in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to dwell in the country of Moab. He and his wife and his two sons. Because there was a famine in Bethlehem, Judah, this guy is going to leave the place where God has him, and he's going to go to another place because they're hungry, because they're empty, because they're starving. They're going to try to go to another place to see if they can find provision somewhere else. Now, we'll get into who these characters are in the next verse, but before we move past verse 1, it's very important, especially in the book of Ruth, to understand the names of these places and the names of these people. Notice that this family is from Bethlehem, Judah. Bethlehem means house of bread. Judah means praise. So they were from the house of bread, uh, specifically the place of praise. And they went and they dwelled in the country of Moab. Now, Moab means like his father. And the reason why Moab means that is um, from Genesis chapter 19, verse 37. Moab got its name from a guy named Moab. And the guy named Moab got his name because he had an interesting conception. You see, he, uh, his dad was Lot, and his mom was also his sister, because this is the dysfunction that happens sometimes with the wickedness of man's hearts. Back there in Genesis, we see that Lot and his family flee Sodom and Gomorrah because it got destroyed. And as now him and his two daughters have just left this city that was destroyed, their thought is that the whole world has been destroyed. All this, our city has been destroyed. This could have happened everywhere. We think we might be the only people left. So Lot's daughters go, we don't want, uh, you know, our, uh, our, uh, prosper- our prosperity. Mm, is that the word I want? <laughs> Got to be careful. Uh, pros- not prosperity. Yeah, we want kids, essentially. So they go, we don't want our, our genealogy to end with us. So they go, we got to do something. The only guy who's here is our dad. So uh, they end up getting him drunk, and they have him lay with them. And one of the kids from this incestuous relationship is Moab. And the point that I'm making here is, is Moab is not a good place. It didn't start out well, and uh, it's not a good place in the Bible. As a matter of fact, in Deuteronomy chapter 23, God warned warns his people about this area of Moab. Deuteronomy chapter 23, verses 3 through 6, God says this. He says, An Ammonite and a Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the tenth generation. None of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road uh, when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired uh, against um, you uh, Balaam, the son of Beor, uh, from uh, Pithor of Mesopotamia to curse you. God says, don't even let a Moabite enter into your city. And now we see a Jewish family entering into the city of Moab. Now in Psalm chapter 6 verse 8, God says this about Moab. Psalm chapter 60 verse 8. He says, Judah is my lawgiver. Moab is my wash pot. Moab's the place where... Um, the extra water goes. It's my sewer system. 
he says. That's how God sees Moab because that's how Moab lived. It was not a good place. But here's why I'm spending so much time on this. Here you have this family leave the house of bread and and praise to go to a place that's literally a dump. And God warned them. He says, you don't want to go to this place, but they choose to go to it anyway. Now, this isn't Moab, Utah. It's fine to still go to Moab, Utah, Evan. That's, that's acceptable. But this Moab here in the Middle East, God says, you want to avoid that. So verse 2 says, the name of the man was Elimelech. This is the father's name. The name of his wife was Naomi. The name of his two sons were uh, Malon and Chilion. They were uh, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah, and they went to the country of Moab, and they remained there. Now we finally get introduced to who this family is. The dad's name is Elimelech, and Elimelech, uh, it it means, um, let's see here, fruitful. He's a fruitful guy. Uh, We have Naomi. Naomi means pleasant, and we have uh, Maholon. Now, these kids have weird names. Sick is what the first one means. Chilion means fading or tired. Literally, these kids' names are sick and tired, right? (laughs) These guys were not healthy kids. We got sick and tired coming from Elimelech and from Naomi. And actually, Elimelech, it it doesn't mean fruitful. That's what uh, Ephratites means. Elimelech means my God is king. So Elimelech, El, uh, God, Elimelech is my God is king. So here's a man whose name means my God is king is now leaving the land that his God has given them to try to find provision in this place that's a dump. He's got his wife whose name means pleasant, by the way. And by the way, when your God is king, your life is ple- your wife is pleasant. Huh? When your God is king, your wife is pleasant, like Naomi. <laughs> if Jesus is not in charge of your life, uh, you know, and you're like, man, you know, there's problems at home. I, you know, have Jesus be at the top of things and that might help a little bit. Anyway, the name of his two sons, we have them sick and tired and they came from, uh, Ephrathites and that means fruitful of Bethlehem of Judah of praise. And they went to the country of Moab and they remained there. Verse three, then Elimelech, Naomi's husband, he died and she was left with her two sons. As they get to this place of Moab, trying to find provision, somehow, some way, her husband ends up dying, and now she is a widow. Verse 4, now, they took wives, these two sons, sick and tired. They took wives of the women of Moab. The name of one was Orpah, not Oprah, but Orpah. <laughs> the name of the other was Ruth, and they dwelt there about 10 years. Naomi Elimelech, the two kids, they move. Dad ends up dying. The two boys, they get married off, though, to these two Moabite ladies. Now, Oprah, Orpah, say it right, come on. Orpah means strong-necked or stubborn, we would say. And Ruth, she's got a good name, friend or friendship or friendly. And they dwelt there for about 10 years. Now, Ruth, she's kind of what this book is all about. That's why the book is called the book of Ruth. But she's important on several levels. One, she's the great, great grandmother or the great, yeah, the great, great grandmother of King David. She's one of four ladies in the lineage of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1. She's, it's from her line that the Messiah is going to come from. She's the great-great-grandma of King David who will come on the scene in the book of Samuel. So she's an important character when it comes to the Bible. And she doesn't seem real important here, but she'll, she'll take a prominent role, no doubt. So here are these two boys, sick and tired, end up marrying stiff-necked and friendly. So guess who got the better end of that deal? Whoever married Ruth. <laughs> so... Here they dwell for 10 years. 10 years pass. Life seems to be, well, pretty good. Verse 5, though. Then both uh, Malon and Chilion also died. So the woman survived her two sons and her husband. Over a process of 10 plus years, she moves away and her husband dies and her two sons end up dying. And now you have these three ladies, mother-in-law and now these two daughter-in-laws that are all without husbands. So verse 6 says, Then she arose, this is Naomi and her daughters-in-laws, that she might return to the country of Moab, that she would go home. For she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had visited his people by giving them bread. She gets up after all this heartache and calamity throughout these, uh, this decade plus, and she goes, it's time for me to go back to where God wants me. It's time for me to go back to Bethlehem. 
and Judah because she's heard rumor that God has been providing for his people. Interesting. Before we get into that, notice there in verse 6 it says that she rose that she might return. And verse 6 it talks about returning. And verse 7, the end of verse 7, it says that she would return to the land of Judah. Verse 8 she says that she would go and return. Verse 10 talks about returning. Verse uh, 15 talks about returning. Verse 22 speaks of returning. The theme of chapter 1 is going home, is returning back to where you came from. And here we see Ruth uh, already in verse number 6 with this desire to go back to where God wants her to go. So she rises up, she gets her two daughter-in-law, she says, hey, let's go so that we could return uh, from this country of Moab because, and this is the real reason why, it says, for she heard while she was there in the country of Moab, that the Lord had been visiting his people and giving them bread. Rumor was spreading that the God of Israel was providing for Israel. Go figure that God would provide for his people. And she's like, man, I need to go back because the famine is over. God is now providing for us as his people once again. So she, she wants to go back home. And I like this because the reason why she wants to go back to God is because she's hearing rumors of God's goodness to his people. And so too in our lives, I wonder if people are hearing enough from us of his goodness. I wonder if it could be said about us. Man, do you know how good God is to his people? How do you know that? Because I hear his people talk about his goodness. You know, we should be a type of people that are spreading the rumor that God is good to us as his people because it can cause those who have backslidden to come back because they're, they're not happy. Okay, they're a child of God. They backslidden. They're on the fence. They're not really happy. And all of a sudden, they start hearing all these rumors about how God's being faithful to his people. And they can be like, well, I'm one of God's people. You are. Get back with his people, and guess what? You'll be blessed just like the rest of them. And here we see Naomi doing this exact same thing. So she goes back with them, and here's what I like about verse 6, actually. She hears that God is providing bread, where? At Bethlehem, which means house of bread. But here's what we need to realize about our God. Our God doesn't just provide the bread. He is the bread. John chapter 6, verse 35, Jesus says, I am the bread from life, uh, or the bread of life. Jesus isn't just the provider of the bread. He is the bread that is being provided for them. Verse 7 says, therefore, she went out from this place where she was, she and her two daughter-in-laws with her, and they went on their way to return to the land of Judah. They start a journey to leave Moab to go back to Judah. This is a 50-mile journey. They start to head back to where God would have her. Now, understand what has just happened here. So there was a famine in Judah, so they left. So here's how it worked. Life was hard, so they wandered off. Life got harder, and then they hear of God's faithfulness, and then they want to return, verse number seven says, back to the land of Judah, or we could say back to praise. And this is what happens. Life gets hard. We know this. But when life gets hard, sometimes we start to wander. Sometimes we start to backslide. Sometimes we try to find satisfaction from somewhere else besides Judah, besides just spending time with the Lord, besides just praising him. So we wander around. And we realize when we're wandering that life gets even harder. But then hopefully we hear rumor of God's faithfulness to his people, which causes us to want to then return and go back to praise, which is where we started at in the first place. And we need to realize that for us, as far as on this side of heaven, it's never too late for us to go back to Judah. It's never too late for us to return back to that place of praise. And here we see Naomi now leading her two daughter-in-laws to that place. Verse 8 says, And Naomi said to her two daughter-in-laws, Go, return each to her mother's house. The Lord deal kindly with you as you have dealt with the dead and with me. She actually, though, doesn't want them to go back with her to Bethlehem. She goes, you guys, go back to your homeland. She goes, look, you did your thing. You were married to my sons. They've died. You don't need to stick around with me. You're free to go. And this is important because back then, if you had, um, like in this situation, a mother-in-law who was widowed, it's now your responsibility to take care of her. So these two ladies, you know, culturally, it's important for us to stick around and take care of Naomi. But Naomi now gives them permission 
you got, don't stick around for my sake, she says. You guys can go. And she actually wants to bless them on their going. She goes, you guys return each to your mother's house. And she goes, may the Lord bless you, deal kindly with you, just like you've dealt kindly with me and with the dead, she says. In the same way that you bless me, she goes, I pray that God would bless you as you kind of go back home and reestablish a new life now. She goes, move on, you know, do, do your own thing. Now, here's what's interesting in verse 8. She says, uh, the Lord deal kindly with you. That word kindly, it's, it's a word in the Old Testament that speaks of God's covenant promise that he's made with Israel. So here we have Naomi, a Jewish mother-in-law, saying to her Gentile daughter-in-laws, may God deal kindly with you. And that word speaks of the way that God would treat his covenant people. So essentially what she's saying is, may God treat you as if you were one of his. That's a good heart for her to have, right? May, may, may he treat you as if you are part of Israel, even though you're not. Verse 9, the Lord grants that you may find rest, each in the house of her husband. So she kissed them and lifted up, and they lifted up their voices and they wept. Kiss goodbye, go on your way, don't worry about me, I'll be just fine, I'm going to go home, I'll be taken care of, you guys don't need to feel responsible for me. All this great stuff happens. Verse 11, but Naomi said, uh, turn back, my daughters. Why will you not go with me? Uh, verse 10, and they said to her, surely we will return with you and to your people. Go home. No, we're going to follow you. We want to go with you to your people. Ah, their heart is to, even though the obligation is no longer there, their heart is still in it. Verse 11, but Naomi said, turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Are there still sons in my womb that they may be your husbands? Uh, you think that I'm going to have kids all of a sudden and you can marry that? She's like, that's not going to happen. Like, wh why would you want to go? She's genuinely like, why would you want to stick around with, you know, this old mother-in-law? Verse 12. Turn back, my daughters, go, for I'm too old to have a husband. <laughs> if, I, I, if I should say I have hope, if I should say I have a husband tonight, should I also bear sons? I'm too old to marry, she says. And she goes, you guys are still young, though. Go back to your homeland. Find, get married off again. Find happily ever after. Verse 13, would you wait for uh, them till they were grown? If I was to even find a husband and have kids, you wouldn't wait for my sons to grow up and then marry them. She's saying it's pointless for you to stick around with me. She said, would you restrain yourself from having a husband? No, my daughters, for it grieves me to give much for your sake that the hand of the Lord has gone out against me. She goes, don't stick around. You see, Naomi cared about these two uh, daughter-in-laws enough to say, you know what? I love you enough to let you go. I love you enough to, to have you move on and to build your own life and to not be wrapped around me. She goes, don't, don't stay single for my sake. She goes, go, go have happiness. And I like this because through Naomi's heart here, we're seeing what Paul told us to do in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 3. Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul says this. Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit. But in lowliness in mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look out, not only for your own interests, but also for the interests of others. And here we see Naomi doing that exact thing. For She'll be lonely. She knows it. But she goes, man, I care about you enough to have you go and do your own thing. So she, again, tries to kind of push them away. Verse 14. Then they lifted up their voices, and they wept again. And Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. Oh, you know, isn't this, and they, there's a lot of crying involved with these ladies, go figure, right? Here they are crying again, they're all weeping. Isn't it just so sweet, well, right? You care about it so much. And Oprah, she kisses her mother-in-law goodbye. Orpah goes on about her business. She heads back to her land, but Ruth doesn't. Ruth clings to Naomi to not let her go. She holds on tight to her. Now, I find this interesting because now here's these two daughter-in-laws. One chooses to kiss Naomi goodbye and to head back. She's honoring Naomi's wishes, honestly, but Ruth goes, no. She goes, I'm not going to leave. And she clings onto her, literally grabs a hold of Naomi. And she's like, you're not getting rid of me that easy, right? <laughs> you got friends like that. You're like, would you just leave me alone? And they're right there still. You're like, no, seriously, leave me. They're like, no, you turn around. They're right there. It's like, they're like, no, you're not going to get rid of me. We're in this. And we'll see Ruth's commitment here in a couple of verses. It's a very, very beautiful thing she says. 
So Orpah kisses her goodbye. She leaves, and Ruth sticks around. She clings on to Naomi. Now, here's what's interesting. Guess what this isn't the book of? This is not the book of uh, Orpah. (laughs) I almost said Oprah. This is not the book of Orpah. You know why? Because Orpah left. This is the book of Ruth because Ruth stayed and was committed to Naomi. Orpah is no longer mentioned in this book because she's no longer pertinent (laughs) to the story. She's no longer relevant to the story. So guess what? She gets to go. And I find this interesting in our lives because there's some people in our lives that are seasonal and there's some people in our lives that are there for the long haul. There's some people that only need to be involved in this much of your story. And when they're done, you need to let them go. Because if you try to hold on to people that are seasonal and you try to make them the long-term type, you're just going to have a whole lot of heartache. There's, actually, I, I get some of this idea from, um, this is going to sound really spiritual. You guys know who Medea is? Tyler Perry has uh, this uh, character that he has these movies of, and there's actually this YouTube video of uh, Medea giving advice to this guy about this, and it's like, yeah, if someone wants to walk out of your life, you let them walk out, because um, people are, some people are just seasonal, some people are there for the long term. If you try to make seasonal people long-term people, it's just not going to work out, and you need to accept it. And here we see Orpah. Man, she hits the road. We don't hear from her again because she's no longer part of the story of Ruth. And there's people in our past that were part of our stories for a season, but they're not anymore. And there's other people that come into our life, and they're there for the long haul, like Ruth and Naomi here. Verse 15 says, and she said, this is what is being said. Now look, your sister, this is Naomi speaking to Ruth, look, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. Follow her. Ruth, uh, Naomi's still trying to get rid of Ruth. She goes, I got rid of one. Let's try to get one more. Follow your sister-in-law. Go. She's already left. She's going back to her people. She's going back, interesting, to her gods, plural, because the Moabites worship pagan gods. One of the main gods of the Moabites was uh, Chemish, and one of the ways that they worshiped uh, this god was by child sacrifice, which this kind of shows a little bit of the depravity and where Naomi's heart is, because Naomi goes... Instead of saying, come back to Israel with me and worship Yahweh, she goes, go ahead and go back to your old life and worship your old gods. But verse 16 says this, and this verses 16 and 17 is one of the most heartfelt poetic things that's ever been written in any book. These are sometimes read at weddings, but this is actually something that's said between a daughter-in-law and her mother-in-law. But get this, I'll just read them and then we'll go back and talk about it. But Ruth said, And treat me not to leave you or to turn back from following after you. For wherever you go, I will go. And wherever you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Ah, here Ruth's heart just comes out towards her mother-in-law, Naomi, and she goes, no, here's the deal. I'm not, you don't, you're not getting this through your head. I'm not leaving you. She goes, entreat me not to leave you or to turn my back. Stop telling me to leave you because I'm not going to, she says. Stop entreating me to leave you or to turn my back from following after you. For, she goes, here's the deal. Wherever you go, I'm going to go. Wherever you lodge, I'm going to lodge. Your people shall be my people. I want to be part of your family, she says. I want to be part of your people. And the last part of verse 16, that last line is the big part. She says, in your God, my God. Ruth goes, man, I don't even just want to be part of your family or part of your people. She goes, I want your God. And the reason, this is the goal, by the way, that people would look at our lives and say, "Um, I I want to know the God you know. That's what, that should be the goal of our lives, that people would see how we respond, how we react, and they would go, I don't know it all, but here's what I do know. I want to know the God you know, because the God you know is powerful. The God you know provides. The God you know, and they could go down the list, and here we see Ruth seeing that through the life of Naomi, and she goes, I want to go back to this God that's providing for your people in Bethlehem. I want to be a part of this thing, and we see that Ruth here has now Well, we could use the word repented. She's chosen to set aside these 
false gods of Moab and to start worshiping the true and living God. And in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, it says this, For they themselves declared concerning us what manner of entry we had to you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. She turned from her idols to the true and living God, as Paul says in First Thessalonians. She goes, yeah, I'm done with that. I'm going to follow after your God. Now, as she says, and your God, my God, let's understand the picture of this. Ruth is a Gentile. Naomi is a Jew. This Gentile daughter-in-law says to her mother-in-law, I want your God to be my God. And in this, we should see a hint of what the church is. The church has said to Israel, to the Jewish people, God's covenant people, um, we want our God to be your God. And, and all of this is God setting it up. But in Romans chapter 11, it lays it out pretty clear for us that we as the church are not replacing Israel. We're actually grafted into Israel. Romans chapter 11, verses 17 through 24, Paul says this, and if some of the branches were broken, and he's talking about Israel being here, if some of the branches were broken off and you being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them and with them became a partaker of the root and fatness of the olive tree, do not boast against the branches, but if you do boast, remember that you do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, branches were broken off that I might be grafted in. Well said, because of unbelief they were broken off, and you stand by faith. Do not be haughty, but fear. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he may not spare you either. Therefore, consider the goodness and sovereignty of God on those who fell uh, se sever severity, but towards you, goodness. If you continue in his goodness, otherwise you also will be cut off. And they also, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in uh, again. For if you were cut off of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivative olive tree, how much more will these who are natural branches be grafted into their own olive tree? What Paul's laying out for us here is that God is not through with the Jew. And he says, you got a tree. And Israel rejected the Messiah. Some branches were broken off. He says, but you as the church were then grafted on. And now you need to realize that you are not supporting the tree. The tree is supporting you. We, our roots are in Judaism. We're studying a book. The Old Testament is to the Jewish people. So he says, here's the deal. But don't get too haughty. Don't think you're better than them because some branches were broken off and you were grafted on because the tree is supporting you. You're not supporting the tree. Your roots are in Judaism. You're the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yahweh is the same God you serve. And he goes, and here's the deal. In the future, God is able to graft back on Jewish people who rejected him. And he's talking about the work that he's going to complete with Israel, the covenant that he made with them. If God makes a covenant, he's going to complete it. And we see that happening during the time of the tribulation period. And my point is the church says to the Jew, your God is my God. And that's the only case. Our God is not the same God as Islam. Our God is not Allah. Our God is Yahweh though. And that Christians and Jews do share the same God. No other religious system do. We don't share any other God with any other person. Yahweh of the Old Testament is Jesus of the New Testament. That's the part they're missing. They don't realize his name's Jesus, right? They're missing out on that part. But we pray that their eyes would be open um, and that they would be uh, saved. And we see there at the uh, end of the book that uh, Israel will indeed be saved. But that's a whole other point. Verse 17 says, where you die, she says, I will die. And there will I be buried. The Lord do so to me, and more also, if anything but death parts you and me. Essentially what she says is, till death do us part, right? She goes, I'm in this till the end, Naomi. I'm not going to leave your side. So, verse 18 says, when she saw that she was determined to go with her, 
she stopped speaking to her. Man, when she realized she wasn't going to change Ruth's mind, she finally gave up, which was smart, right? She goes, I, I, I'm not going to change your mind. You're determined to stay with me. She goes, I'm just going to stop bringing up the matter. We're going to keep heading back home. Verse 19, now the two of them went until they came to Bethlehem. And it happened when they had come to Bethlehem that all the city was excited because of them. And the woman said, is this Naomi? <laughs> they get back home. Ten plus years has passed. Naomi comes back. She's got the stranger with her, Ruth. Everyone's excited. Who's this new person coming to town? They're all excited. They walk up. They go, Naomi, is that you? Right? Life's been a little hard on her. It's been ten plus years, and it's like it kind of looks like her, but we're not quite sure because, well, time can be hard on some of us. You know, I've only been out of high school for six years, but I'll see people that I graduated high school with, and it's like, you look really old, and you've gotten really fat in six years. I look exactly the same, so I don't know what their problem is, but it's like, man, time's been hard on you. And this is what's happening with Naomi here. They're going, is that you? <laughs> she goes, sure enough, it's me. It's been 10 years. It's been a rough 10 years, but notice this. She finally and here's some more imagery for us, and let's see, make sure we don't get lost in this. But Naomi now finally returns back to her homeland. Remember that word return that we saw a lot? And notice she returns back with the assistance of the Gentile. And Israel became a nation again because of the, gen because of the church, because of evangelical Christians that um, had pity, quite honestly, on Israel. Israel is able to exist today as a nation. They're able to go back to their homeland, like we see Naomi is able to go back to her homeland, the promised land of Israel. So another interesting picture that's painted here. Uh, so they go, Naomi, is that you? Verse 20. But she said to them, don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. Is that you, Naomi? Yes, but my name has changed. You ever meet people like that? They change in their name, and it's like, why do you do that? Just stop it, right? I am no longer go by this. I go by that. It's like, well, I'm going to call you what your mom calls you, so, <laughs> right? She goes, don't call me Naomi anymore, She goes, which means pleasant. She goes, call me Mara, which means bitter. Why? Well, because I am bitter. Why? She tells us here, for the Almighty God has dealt very bitterly with me. Naomi, pleasant, is that you? It is me, but don't call me pleasant. Why? Because I'm not pleasant. <laughs> okay, <laughs> at least you're honest, right? She goes, I'm bitter, so you should call me Mara. You should call me bitter. And the reason why I'm bitter is because I've been con for 10 plus years, and I've had a rough life. My husband died, my two kids have died, and it's been uh, quite the experience for sure. And she goes, I'm kind of bitter at the Almighty right now. And I find this interesting. She goes, call my name Mara. In Exodus chapter 15, verse 22, it says this. The children of Israel, they're in the, the wilderness and they're thirsty. So it tells us in verse 22, So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea, and they went out into the wilderness of Shur, and they went three days in the wilderness, and they found no water. They're parched. Three days in the wilderness is a long time without any water. They've, they've drained all their water bottle supply, verse 23. Now, when they came to Mara, same word, bitter, they could not drink the water of Mara, for they were bitter. Well, that makes sense, right? Because it's called bitter. Therefore, the name of it is called Mara. So here's the children of Israel. They're thirsty. They get to this place of water. They're all excited. They dig in and they're like... This stuff is gross. It's this tastes like LaCroix, right? This is not good at all. It's missing an important ingredient called sugar. We got to get rid of this stuff, right? So they spit it out because it's bitter. And God says, here's the deal. Verse 24. The people, they complain against Moses saying, what shall we drink? We can't drink this gross, bitter water. Verse 25. So he, Moses, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree. And when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made a statue and an ordinance for them, and there he tested them. God, we can't drink this water. Why? Because it's bitter. It's Mara. Moses goes to the Lord. Lord, what should I do with this bitterness? Take part of this tree, mix it up, and the thing that was once bitter will become sweet. Naomi says, don't call me pleasant. Call me bitter. 
What Naomi needs is some stirring with a stick in her life, right? She needs to be stirred up a little bit so that her bitterness becomes sweetness. And in this, this stirring of the waters of Mara going from bitter to sweet is a beautiful picture of the cross. Because here the Lord says to Moses, you got some bitterness. He says, but take the tree, picturing the tree, the wood that Jesus would die on, apply that to the center of the situation, and all of a sudden your bitterness well, it'll become a little bit more sweeter. It happened for Israel. We see Naomi, she, well, she's kind of having a pity party. And you know the problem with pity parties? You're usually the only one that shows up to them, right? You invite people and they just don't like coming when you're throwing a little pity party. And here Naomi's doing the exact same thing and she needs to apply the, the wood, the cross to her life to turn that bitterness into some sweetness. But she goes, hey, don't call me pleasant, call me bitter because the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. She's blaming God for her situation. And uh, we like to do that. We have to blame someone, and we can't take responsibility for ourselves. So we have to blame someone, so we might as well blame God. So here she is blaming the Almighty, blaming God. And I can't help but be reminded of what takes place in the Gospel of John when we see Naomi blaming God for these deaths in her family. In John chapter 11, starting in verse number 11, we see that Jesus, and by the way, if you die, I'm going to share this verse at your funeral, so you get a little prequel of what's going to be said. John chapter 11, I generally speak on this at funerals, but here we see that Jesus is one of his really good friends, Lazarus, is sick. And uh, some word gets to Jesus that Lazarus is sick and that he's going to die. And Jesus goes, well, I'm going to head back to where Lazarus is and kind of see him and help him out. And as Jesus heads back, he gets a little bit distracted. Some ministry gets going on and he's not able to get there right away. So by the time uh, Jesus is getting back to where Lazarus is, Lazarus has actually already died and been buried. Uh, but in verse 11 of John chapter 11, it says, these things he said after that, he said to them, our friend Lazarus sleeps. But I go that I may wake him. And I'm sure Jesus says this with a smile on his face because we know what he's up to, right? He goes, he's just sleeping. They go, Lazarus is dead. He goes, my friend Lazarus sleeps. I'm going to go wake him up. Verse 12, then his disciple says, well, Lord, if he sleeps, he's going to get better. But they didn't know he's actually dead. But Jesus goes, I'm going to resurrect him. Verse 13, however, Jesus spoke of his death. But they thought that he was speaking about taking rest and sleep. There's the confusion. Verse 14, that Jesus said to them plainly, Lazarus is dead. Okay, now we get it. Verse 15. And I'm glad for your sake that I was not there, that you may believe. Nevertheless, let us go to him. Okay, Jesus, it sounds like you're missing some of that compassion we read about, right? You flat out tell us you're glad someone has died. Jesus goes, yep. Why? So that some of y'all could believe. Hmm. You know, God does things way differently than we would. So, verse 13 says, however, Jesus spoke to his, of his death. Uh, he's, okay, verse 15, and I'm glad, verse 16, there we go. Then Thomas, who's called the twin, said to his fellow disciples, disciples let us go also, that we may die with him. <laughs> okay, so they're all going to go and die, verse 17. So, when Jesus came, he found that he had already been in the tomb for four days. There's where Lazarus is. Now, Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles away. And uh, many of the Jews had joined the women, this is Mary and Martha, to comfort them concerning their brother. They had their funeral, everyone's there, they're sobbing. Verse 20, then Martha, as soon as she heard that Jesus was coming, went and met him. But Mary, she was sitting in the house. Now Martha said to Jesus, she meets Jesus on the road. She runs out to him, hey, Jesus is on his way. She runs out, she meets him in the driveway, and this is what Martha says to Jesus. Lord, if you had been here my brother would not have died. Who does she blame? Almighty God. Jesus, if you would have showed up, Lazarus would still be alive. Naomi says, Almighty God has dealt bitterly with me. She's blaming God for deaths in her family. If you would have been here, my brother would not have died, verse 22. But even now, she goes, I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said to him, I know, Jesus, I know he'll rise again in the resurrection at the last days. Verse 25, but Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord. I believe that you are the Christ, the son of God, who is to come into the world. Amen. Interesting. Yes, good, good stuff. Jesus goes, man, Martha, Lazarus is dead, but he's going to live again. 
I, in the resurrection end times, I've read Revelation, I know. Right, obviously she hadn't because it's before that, but that's what we would say. I know all about that stuff. I've read about the resurrection. He goes, no, 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 you don't get it. I'm the resurrection. And Jesus goes, even if someone dies physically, if they believed in me, he says, they'll never have to die spiritually. And to carry on that idea of um, death in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, Paul says, for we know that if our earthly house, this tent is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. He, he, he likens this body as a tent. He likens what's awaiting us as a building. Now, I don't know a whole lot about life, but I know that buildings are generally more comfortable than tents are, right? So we got uncomfortableness in this tent that we're stuck in this earthly body. He says, four, in this, we groan eagerly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. We as believers know that we're lacking, that we, we, we know that we're constrained by this fleshly, earthly body, and, and we're kind of actually, our spirit's kind of groaning to be clothed with what's awaiting us in heaven. Verse 3 says, if indeed, having been clothed, we shall not be found naked. Amen on that one, right? That's good news for us. We're, gonna be, we're, we're not going to be less clothed. He says we're going to be further clothed. Verse 4, for we who are in this tent groan. Being burdened. Is this body a burden sometimes? Man, you wake up and you're like, huh, this is kind of burdening. This burden's hurting me today. I need to take some aspirin for this tent, right? Not because we want to be unclothed. This burden, this groaning is not that we want to be unclothed, but further clothed that mortality may be swallowed up by life. Now, he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. So we are always confident, knowing that while we are at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord. That's pretty true. We can be very confident of that truth. You all are in this room. You know what that means? You're not in the presence of Jesus physically because you're in my presence right now, right? And there's a big difference between me and Jesus. So he goes, we're confident when, you, when you're in this body, you're not with the Lord. But he says um, in verse 6, so we are all, always confident knowing that we are uh, when we're at home in the body, we're absent from the Lord, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 80 says, but we are confident, yes, well pleased rather, to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And the same way we have assurance that when we're in this earthly body, we're not in the presence of Jesus physically. We know that when a believer leaves this earthly body, they are in the presence of the Lord physically. So he goes on to say in verse 9, therefore, we make it our aim, whether present or or absent, to be well-pleasing to him. Here's our goal. Here's our aim. Here's where our sights are set on. It doesn't matter if you're dead or alive. Your job, please Jesus. So, back to Ruth. That's where we were at. Ruth chapter 1. Ruth is blaming God, just like Martha liked to blame God, but we see that God is not to be blamed for our, our hard times, and God's got plans above that we could ever imagine, and he's prepared a place for those who uh, love him, and uh, although we do miss them, we need to be like Naomi, willing to have them go on, because um, we don't want them to be hindered in their bodies uh, that are deteriorating for our life's sake. So she, she goes, man, the, the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Verse 21, she says, I went out full, and the Lord has brought me home again empty. Why do you call me Naomi? Since the Lord has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me. It's interesting how over 10 years your perspective can change. Because she says, don't call me Naomi, pleasant. Why? Because God has dealt bitterly with me. And she says, I went out full, and here I am coming back empty. Well, 10 years ago you didn't think you were full. The reason why you left is because you thought you were empty. Remember, there was a famine. We gotta, we're empty. God's not going to provide. We got to go. We don't have anything. We got to go. What she didn't realize is she actually had it all. And it took 10 years and losing three very important people for her to realize that, man, 10 years ago when I thought I was empty, I was actually full. And now here I am empty. You know, this is how it can happen sometimes. And even though this actually isn't a, a, a good thing that she's saying, in it, it can be applied in a good way. I went out full, and she says, and the Lord has brought me back empty. 
brought me home empty. She says, you know, the best way to return home is empty. There's no point in returning home full. Jesus fills us up. Our job is kind of to wring ourselves dry on this earth, honestly. If you got more to give when you go home, what are you doing going home, right? Give it all now. Be, as Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, verse 17, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering. You should, I apply this day by day. You should go home at the end of the day empty. Lord, in the morning you can fill me up afresh again, but I'm going to go home empty because, Lord, you've made me empty because you've surrounded me with people to be poured out on top of as a drink offering. And here's Naomi saying this in a negative sense, but I think we can kind of apply it positively. Verse 22. So Naomi, she returned, and Ruth the Moabite is her daughter-in-law with her, who returned from the country of Moab. Now they came to Bethlehem at the beginning of of the barley harvest. This is springtime, April, right around the time of Passover, actually. So where we're at in Matthew on Sunday mornings is correlating with where we're at in Ruth on Wednesday nights. We're right approaching springtime barley harvest, which, by the way, the book of Ruth is one of five books that the Jewish people read during the time of the feasts. And the book of Ruth specifically is the book that would be read during the time of Pentecost, And I find it interesting that the book of Ruth is read during the time of Pentecost because Ruth is about a Gentile bride coming into Israel. And we know that that's what happened in Acts chapter 2 when God poured out his Holy Spirit on the church. Gentile, the Gentile bride, the church, was now brought in with God's promised people. And again, it's just another layer of Um, all of this stuff. So we're going to see in this next chapter that Ruth is going to encounter a a dashing young man whose name is Boaz, and he's dreamy. And and they're going to end up falling in love and actually getting married. But before that happens, he's going to redeem her, and that's a key theme to this book. That word redeem is used over 20 times. And once you finally understand from Ruth chapter 2 what redemption is, it's going to help you better understand what Jesus did for you and me. And Ruth chapter 2 is actually key. Understanding the story of Boaz and Ruth is key to understanding Revelation chapter 5, because in Revelation chapter 5, we see... um, this idea of redemption talked about there in heaven, and you, you get a fuller understanding once you uh, see it in light of Ruth chapter 2. But we'll save those things for next week. Tonight, let's close with prayer, and we will get out of here. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this evening that you bless us with in Jesus. Um, I pray that as we uh, continue to go through this book of Ruth, Lord, as we see ourselves, Lord, as the Gentile bride, Jesus, as we see you, as the Jewish prince, um, Lord, that we would just be encouraged. Lord, I pray that we would realize that, um, that we're probably way more full than we feel. Lord, it took Naomi 10 years and a lot of heartache to realize that she was actually full when she left And Lord, I pray that you would open up our eyes and cause us to realize, Lord, that we are full. Lord, if we have a roof over our heads, Lord, family and friends that love us, uh, Jesus, you in our hearts and ruling in our lives, Lord, that's what it's about. There's really nothing that we lack if we have you. Um, So help us realize the fullness, Jesus, that is found in uh, us having you. And Lord, um, as we continue to just look at this Jewish Cinderella, Lord, this love story of the book of Ruth, I pray that we would be encouraged as we see you on these pages. Lord, as we see what you've done for us, as we see your love on behalf of us, as we dig in next week into chapter two. So just be with us tonight. Um, Lord, keep us safe as we go home. Um, In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Thank you guys. On Sunday morning, we'll be picking it up in Matthew chapter 21, starting in verse number 18. This kind of correlates with uh, this grafting in thing. We see that Jesus curses a fig tree. Why is he so mad at a tree? Oh, we'll see. You got to show up to find out.